Greetings, Church. Today's message is the first part of a series called Our God's Design Series, which is an annual series that we as a church have been running each year, tackling and talking about different uh, topics and issues which are very relevant to us today. Issues about sexuality, gender, and God's design for our lives. And this year, it also leads into a church and sexual wholeness seminar, which we are conducting in July. So today's topic and question is, is purity possible? Now, you know, even if you just randomly flip through the Bible, it's hard to miss the fact that God's Word frequently talks about sexual purity and warns against sexual immorality. I remember when my daughter started reading the Bible on her own a few years ago when she was about maybe 10 or 11, and she commented to my wife and I that some parts were just so gross. And perhaps it's true, some parts could be labelled PG, parental guidance advised. Because starting in Genesis, you have the dire warning seen in God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, cities that were steeped in sexual immorality. We see God's standard for holiness and purity seen in the law that he gave to his people Israel. And we also see in poetic form, the, in the Song of Songs, celebrating God's design for the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And to hold chapters in Proverbs dedicated to warning against sexual sin. Plus, there are many warnings and judgments throughout Israel's history as they fell into the sexual sins of the cultures that they were in. And then in the New Testament, we see Jesus reinforcing what holiness and purity means and how it goes beyond just our outward actions to what we think in our heart. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28, you have heard it, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus shows us that lust and, and, and our sexual sin is not just something that is in our actions, but even in our thoughts and it goes on in our hearts. But at the same time, we also see how Jesus reaches out to and delivers those trapped in sexual sin, like the woman caught in adultery or the Samaritan woman at the well. And in the letters to the new Christians and churches written by the apostles, we see many exhortations about sexual purity and warnings against sexual immorality. For example, 1 Thessalonians 3 puts it very clearly. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, and we, and we, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. It can't get any clearer than that. Verse 3 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And this call, these standards for purity, are not something that's made up by religious leaders or society but by God himself. As he says in verse 8, Therefore, anyone who rejects his, this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so we read these verses, we hear the sermons preached from those verses, yet in practice, if we're honest, we find it hard or seemingly impossible to follow. Because the challenge to purity is very real. And it's all the more so in what's been called a, a hyper-sexualized culture. We are surrounded by messages that are glorifying or normalizing sexual expression outside of God's design of a man and a woman in a committed covenantal marriage relationship. And these messages come to us through the music we listen to, 
the shows we watch, the books or articles we read, the circle of friends or contacts we keep, from social media and society at large. And I'm not even talking about outright pornography yet. But the Lord knows what a struggle that is, and this is for us. And in many ways, it's actually not that different from what the Christians in New Testament times faced. Most of the new Christians came out of a lifestyle of immorality, and they knew that their only hope for forgiveness and freedom was through Christ. Now here's a description of what society was like at the time. These Gentiles had come out of gross idolatry which had little or no restraint on their moral character, especially in matters of sex. In fact, prostitution was a very prominent part of their religious life since the worship of the so-called gods involved the use of temple prostitutes. The moral climate in the Roman Empire was morally decadent. Immorality was a way of life, and thanks to slavery, people had the leisure time to indulge in the latest pleasures. The Christian message of holy living was new to that culture, and it was not easy for these young believers to fight the temptations around them. Now the Christian message of holy living isn't something new anymore, but it's increasingly being seen as something outdated and irrelevant. But the truth is that God hasn't changed, and his call to purity is as relevant today as it was in the past. And it is a call that we as Christians and as a church need to hear and to heed before it's too late. Listen to what pastor and author Jonathan Grant says. We have been slow to realize the extent of which internet pornography, as well as the broader pornification of, cult of culture, is changing the game in terms of sexual formation. Now more than ever, there is an urgent need to talk about sex in our churches and ministry contexts in a way that engages the spirit of the age. In many ways, internet pornography's power lies in its invisibility. Rather than presenting itself as an obvious problem, it's more like a hidden cancer that spreads silently through each organ until we discover that the body is riddled with it. The church has tended to adopt something like a don't ask, don't tell approach in this sensitive area. But our lack of attentiveness does not stop the cancer from spreading. Instead, it allows more of those under our care to fall into pornography's cycle of shame, addiction, and despair. And you know, in a survey done among Christian youth and young adults in Singapore just a few years ago, 51% of them reported or, um, having viewed pornography in the past one year. And it was also reported that 8% strongly disagreed or disagreed that using pornography goes against their Christian beliefs and values, or 13% neither agreed nor disagreed. Which shows that there's a portion who honestly don't believe that there's anything wrong with watching pornography. And even among those who do think that it's wrong, there's still a significant number who still go ahead and do it anyway. And evangelist and author Josh McDowell warns that the problem is actually even more pervasive. He says this, in every culture in the world, every church in the world, the number one problem is pornography. There is no church in the world, not even in the far furthest jungles of Africa, where pornography is not the number one problem. I would say that almost about almost any church in the world, no matter how biblical it is, how Christ-centered, it affects some of the greatest churches in the world. And he goes on to say this, you can stand up and look out at any congregation of 18 to 34-year-olds and know that about more than 70% of them are addicted to pornography. So we see that the challenge to purity is very real. And broadly, there are three types of challenges to purity that we face, that we can expect to face. The first is that our own sinful and selfish desires are fueled by a culture that glorifies sex outside of God's design, that idolizes the self, that promotes freedom, but which actually only leads to enslavement to our flesh. 
Because our flesh will crave for more and more satisfaction or highs, whether it's from sex or other things like alcohol, substances or any number of things. And soon we find ourselves focused only on feeding those wants, ignoring God's good and perfect will for us and His vision of life that is truly life. Because like, like Adam and Eve, we know what God has said to us and what He's warned us about. Yet we fall for the same old lie of the devil, saying, we, who says, you will not surely die. But we would do well to remember what God's word says in Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. One cannot get away with mocking God or his word. And if we continually do so, we will inevitably reap the corrupting and destructive results in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Another challenge that we face is a distorted view of sex. Because sex has been cheapened to mean almost nothing, but at the same time elevated to mean almost everything. And we see this in the loose attitudes that society and the media increasingly has towards things like pornography and masturbation, and, how, and also about how people regard relationships. That somehow achieving sexual pleasure is the ultimate goal, and it doesn't matter how you get it as long as you're satisfied. It's become elevated to a necessity for happiness and a standard for becoming a man or woman. That if you don't get it, you're missing out or losing out. And even among Christians, we may feel that those who get married are the blessed ones as they have the license to have sex. Whereas those who are single may feel like they are missing out and losing out somehow. But you know what? Sex is not the ultimate goal or reward in life. Our greatest reward is Christ. And this is true for everyone, whether single or married. John Piper says this, Knowing Jesus and his supremacy enlarges our souls so that the thrills of sex become as small as they really are. Nothing else is big enough to enlarge the soul as God intended and make little lusts lose their power. Knowing Jesus and his supremacy, that is the ultimate goal, goal and reward in our life. Author Jonathan and Pastor Jonathan Grant says this, especially within our sexual lives, our hearts must be truly captivated by the goodness of the Christian vision of life so that our whole self is drawn toward it. Otherwise, our commitment to live in tune with it will be brittle. Because indeed, it is a lifelong commitment to live in tune with the vision of life that God has given us. And this, and, the, and this leads to the third challenge, that it is an ongoing battle. It's lifelong, and we cannot ever afford to be ignorant or complacent. Now, you know, although much emphasis is often about um, the temptations faced by young people, we will be naive to think it doesn't affect those who are older too, whether married or single and no matter how mature in age or in faith. And you know, far too often we read about those who have been in Christian ministry for years, whom we regard as really mature Christians, but falling from grace due to sexual sin. And 1 Corinthians 10 gives us this clear warning against self-righteous pride or complacency. Verse 11 says, these things happen to them, meaning Israel, as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. But listen also to what the next verse promises and assures us. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, 
He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So there's a warning, but there's also a hope that we have. Because in this long-drawn battle, we may be tempted to give up along the way, but He is faithful and will provide us a way out so that we can endure it. Now, I've shared, some time ago, I've shared before about how my own journey, that in my 20s, I was very much trapped in addiction, particularly addiction to pornography. And I was, my whole, I was consumed so much by just wanting to satisfy my own lusts and desires. Finally, one day I remember that I felt like I was facing a fork in the road. And there were two possible paths. One was to give up, to just stop calling myself a Christian, to just give in to what my flesh wants, to just go with my desires and and, and, and turn away from God. Or the other path was to cry out to God to change my heart. And by God's grace, I did. I took that path. I, I cried out to Him to change my heart. And God started that work in my heart to transform me from the inside out. I was led to, even as I sought counsel also from, from uh, our pastor at the time, Pastor David, I was led to Psalm 51, and he, where the psalmist, where, where David, the, the psalmist, writes in response to and in confession of what he has done, the own, his own sin, sexual sin that he committed. And, and King David writes this, Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That was my cry to the Lord. And you know, even after more than 20 years, I still find myself needing to cry out that prayer. Because it is a lifelong struggle and a lifelong commitment. And there are still those forks in the road along the way where, where we will have to renew our commitment to follow Him and allow Him into our heart to do His often painful work of recreation and renewal. Because ultimately the change that is needed is a change of heart. And this changing of our heart is an ongoing process. And I've come to learn that the changing of our heart and the creation of a pure one is also not just a passive process where we just sit back and wait for God to do everything. But we have our part to play. We do our part by storing up God's Word in our heart. Like Psalm 119 verses 9 to 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And I believe this is, of course, not just referring to a young man, but a young woman or any man or woman who follows the Lord. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And as we do so, as we store God's word in our heart, we learn more and more about God's heart for us and we grow in that living relationship with him. As author Marshall Siegel puts it, the pursuit of purity then and now is not mainly about rejecting sexual temptation, but about receiving and embracing the heart of God 
Yes, God calls us to walk in purity, but the only path to true, to true purity is covered in blood, the blood of Christ, and leads us to Him. So He calls us into a relationship, a living relationship where He's constantly working in us to change our heart, to create in us a pure heart. But you know, the true long-lasting change that can withstand the ongoing battle is only possible through a living relationship with God. And that also means to be in partnership with His Spirit and His people. Because we cannot fight this battle alone. God makes it very clear that in order to overcome our sinful desires, we must rely on the Holy Spirit He gives us. First of all, being sensitive to his promptings and warnings, not ignoring him nor grieving him. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And verses 5.24-25 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit is given to us by God for us to walk together with Him, that we will not carry out the sinful desires of our flesh. Because as 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are not our own to do anything we want with our body. We are bought with a price. Jesus himself paid the price, laid down his own life for us. And so we are called to live out our life in the Spirit empowered by Him to glorify God in our body. And on top of that, God's Word also makes it clear that we need one another. We need a community of fellow brothers and sisters. We need to come to the light. Because sin grows and spreads in the dark and only starts to die with exposure to light. As James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And I believe this is not just about physical healing, but very much about our inner healing also, being healed from our addictions, our sexual sins. Because every Christian is in the battle. And the battle is not meant to be fought alone. You know, I remember some years ago preaching on Ephesians 6 about the armour of God and the spiritual battle that we're in. And very often maybe we get this image of just a solitary soldier or maybe a, like a gladiator putting on the armour and fighting the spiritual battle on his own or her own. But that is not the, the image that, I don't believe that it's the image that, that is, is meant to be uh, from Ephesians 6. Because the image of a, of a soldier, and in that time very much so the Roman soldiers, was that they, they never fought alone. The, the strength of the Roman army was in their formations, was in them fighting as a, as a very close and cohesive unit together in in, in formation, covering one another's backs. And that's exactly how God wants us to fight this battle, together, not as a solitary gladiator trying to be the hero, but very much side by side with brothers and sisters, leaning on one another, depending on one another, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this battle is not meant to be fought alone. 
So we come to the question, is purity possible? And the answer, yes and no. Just like anything else in the Christian life of following Jesus and full obedience to God, it isn't difficult. It's impossible. It's impossible on our own strength, but possible only when we ask and allow Him to create a pure heart in us. And when we do it together with the Spirit that God Himself gives us and the community of fellow believers that He puts us in. That is what makes purity possible, living out the life that He calls us to. I want to share this uh, true life uh, story which I, I read from uh, the Thirst uh, online uh, Christian magazine. And it's about, uh, the title itself is self-explanatory. It says, I'm a woman and I struggle with pornography and masturbation. And I just want to read an excerpt from this uh, uh, young uh, woman's story. She says this, I even began to doubt God's love for me, wondering if God could really forgive me every time I repented. I know now that I, it was the enemy's lie, but I did not feel worthy of God's love, nor did I dare to call myself his child. How could he perfectly love someone as imperfect as me? This sin was my deepest and darkest secret for more than 13 years. No one else knew about it but me. It ate me up inside to be struggling with such a thing. If I had a choice, I would have chosen any other sin beside this one. I could barely even face God and confess my sins at times. Through the years, I've read many books and articles on overcoming sexual sin. The advice was similar. Tell someone who, who can hold you accountable. But the idea of letting someone know my painful secret was just pure horror. Probably more horrifying than any movie. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So I avoided the obvious prompting each time I came across this advice, convincing myself that I could overcome it on my own. I didn't need the help of another person. What can someone else do for me? It's my own battle. I will overcome it. And little did I know that this was pride. And sometime last year, I decided I wanted to face up to this issue honestly. I had hidden it long enough and it was time for me to come out and live a life worthy of God's calling. God was speaking strongly into my heart about the importance of purity. It wasn't what I had initially thought, just abstain from premarital sex. That was easy for me. All I had to do was avoid being in a relationship. But his standard was much higher than that. In his books, purity includes not just purity of the body, but of the mind and in action. And this, the revelation humbled me. I found myself praying, God, your standard is, is way too high. I desire to reach it, but you know I can't do it on my own. And one night during my quiet time with God, I came across an article on what it means to overcome sin. This line stood out to me. Overcoming sin is a habitual weakening of sin that involves constant fighting and contending against sin. Now, honestly, I was a little disappointed. The word constant fighting made me dis feel discouraged. You mean I have to constantly fight this stubborn sin of mine? God, can't you just take it away from me after some prayer? But in that same moment, God was showing me that Overcoming sin is a daily decision. It's not something that is a once-off, repent and immediately you no longer struggle. It doesn't work that way. We live in a sinful world. Our flesh is sinful. Every single day we are, bombard we are bombarded with, with temptation for as long as you and I still live. Yet it is in the midst of this temptation that we can make decisions to obey and turn away from sin. Yes, it's really tough at times. There are times I've successfully overcome my physical desires, but there are also times I've failed and fallen. Through it all, I have learned to celebrate every small victory along the way, even if it may seem like I have failed more than I've achieved. And she goes on to say this, One day as I was texting my best friend, the conversation shifted to being accountable to one another. I'm not sure where the sudden bout of courage came from, but I found myself coming clean with her about my, sex my struggles with sexual sin. 
I was done with the secrecy, done with letting the devil have a stronghold in my life. I finally obeyed the prompting and brought my deeds of darkness to light. Finally obeyed the prompting and brought my deeds of darkness to light. And as a church, we want to be a place to provide a space for people to bring such things to the light, to no longer have to struggle alone in the darkness. Because this, the pandemic has increased our sense of isolation and as a result, it likely drove many people deeper into pornography and, and sexual addiction and other addictions too. Even as we are now emerging from our proverbial caves and society is slowly returning to normal in many ways, there are still those, perhaps many, who are secretly living in darkness, trapped by sexual sin. And perhaps you are in that situation. You may feel you have failed time and time again, but don't give in to the lie that you should give up trying altogether. Don't give up fighting. John Piper says this, God took the record of all your sins, all your sexual failures that made you a debtor to wrath and instead of holding them up in front of your face and using them as the warrant to send you to hell, he put them in the palm of his son's hand and nailed them to the cross. So even if you feel that you have failed time and time again, also remember what Jesus said to the woman that he saved from being stoned due to adultery. In John chapter 8, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your, sin, your life of sin. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And we know that the only way that we can truly leave that life of sin is by asking the Lord to change our hearts by walking, by, by storing His Word in our heart, allowing it to, allowing His Word and, and His Spirit, walking in his, with Him in spirit to transform our lives from the inside out and doing that in a community of fellow brothers and sisters perhaps fellow strugglers. And at YCKC, we hope that our small group churches can be a place where we can find someone whom we trust to share with and help us in such struggles. And we also have a sisters ministry where prayer support is available and a men's support group called At The Cross, dedicated to helping those who want to overcome sexual sin, such as pornography. And you can find out more about these from the bulletin or talk to any of the pastoral staff. Now, there is a lot more on this topic that, that we, we can't cover in such a short message, but which we aim to address in the upcoming Church and Sexual Wholeness Seminar in July, where one of the topics we'll be addressing is how to help those struggling with sexual temptation, such as pornography. So if you're a church member, do remember to sign up. And let us know also if you're inviting any friends along. Allow me now to lead us in prayer. Oh Lord, you are the author of life. And we know, Lord, that in many ways we have strayed from your design, from your good will, Lord, for us. And Lord, we come to you, Lord, crying out to you to change our hearts, to make it true, make it pure to grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. And Lord, we pray that you would help 
each and every one of us, those of us especially who are tr- who feel trapped and who, or who may not even realize that they are trapped, but they are, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work to convict of sin, Lord, and bring to repentance, Lord. And pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Spirit, help us to walk with you, Lord, in spirit. And remember that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That we should glorify you, Lord, in all that we do, and all that we say, and all that we think. So, Lord, pray, Lord, that you would help those who are struggling, Lord, come to the light, to come before you in confession, to bring this up also, Lord, to other our brothers or sisters who can journey along and support in this fight, in this battle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.